Danny and I were discussing the other night. You're worried, right? Uh, we were discussing some of the great sermons of bygone days, much older than, than we are, actually. Uh, and we were talking about some of those sermons were, was a song by the name of Payday Something Today by R.G. Lee. Yes. And uh, then we talked about Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards, uh, a sermon that really sparked a great revival. And, and then God's Three Deadlines by J. Harold Smith. Most of you probably have never heard of any of those sermons, but uh, I would encourage you to avail yourself to the internet and look those up and read them because they're powerful, powerful messages. And we'll do that over here. <laughs> yeah, Dan said we'll do that over here. Uh, but uh, uh, they were all great uh, sermons that uh, hundreds, even thousands of souls were touched by. But they weren't the greatest sermon ever preached. The greatest sermon ever preached is preached by no other than Jesus. Amen. You have it in your Bibles and you can read it regularly. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It's three chapters. Sounds like a lot, but it's really not that many words uh, when it's uh, considered. And so our current sermon series uh, entitled Heart Problems is taken from Matthew chapter 5, the first portion of that sermon series. And chapter 5 begins with the Beatitudes. A lot of people know the Beatitudes and have heard those before. And I picked up last week when we talked about how Jesus did not come to fulfill, the, to, to uh, do away with the law or abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so today, uh, we're going to continue, and in today's sermon, Jesus addresses the problems of their day with the solution of God's Word. And I want you to know today, the solution to our problems today in society and in our lives is God's Word. It's all right there. It's just as relevant today as it was when it was spoken. And so the lawyers of Jesus' day, they called them scribes because they would copy down the actual law, uh, make copies of it by hand, and they were scribes. And so those lawyers, they used to love to quote one another as they would give their uh, rendition of the law, so to speak. And in the process... Uh, in that day and time, they had lost sight of the original writings. In other words, they, they had, uh, uh, were quoting one another, so to speak, without actually listening to what God actually said. And so it's of vital importance that you don't just hear sermons, but that you actually hear God's Word and you actually read God's Word for yourself or... Uh, by chance today, what's happening is God's Word is being lost to the masses. And we see that today when uh, uh, stories that many of you grew up knowing as a child, for instance, Jonah and the whale, the great fish, Zacchaeus, the wee little man, stories, uh, I can name many of them, are totally foreign to many people today, they've never heard those stories. They've never heard God's Word or read God's Word for themselves. In fact, they fear the book of God because they are taught that it's just a uh, superstition and it's just an ancient relic and it has no bearing on the day. Well, on top of this, these scribes had, in addition to just quoting one another, they had uh, hedged God's word, God's commandments, if you will, with additions. And I told you last week there were 613 laws that the Jewish people of that day were supposed to keep. 
Uh, they also added applications. And through all this, they had made the rules less sharp and made their permissions easier. In other words, they were relaxing God's word. If you heard last week's message, it talked about uh, a warning to those who relax God's word, who do not take it seriously, and who in turn teach it to others. Well, we pick up our story today in Matthew chapter 21, uh, through the rest of the chapter, Jesus uh, tells us what God's word says in terms of why, and then he follows it up with an explanation. That's all preaching is. He is taking the word of God and giving an explanation thereof. It's the same thing if you read it in the book of uh, Ezra during a great revival when they stood all day and they, the priest and the Levites would read the word and give the explanation of it. Uh, and so uh, that, that's what preaching is. <coughs> Jesus didn't rewrite the laws or rewrite the commandments, but he brought them back to the heart of what it really means. And so that's what this sermon series is about. It's revealing heart problems in ourselves. And so beginning in verse 21 today, and Brett's back on the computer, and so I think I'll preach backwards today just to confuse him. Um, he thought that's what he done last week, but now I'm going to try to try to go in order for you, Brett. Uh, if you're wondering, I put my outline in the computer, and he just has to pour it. It sounds simple, but it's not. Uh, verse 21 of the greatest sermon they ever preached, by the greatest preacher we ever preached. So as you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. That's the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. And the intent is, thou shalt not commit murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. You know, in today's world, murder it's become so second place. It's become so common, we don't even wink at the news anymore. And I'm not talking about uh, national news now. I'm talking about local news. Where murder takes place right here in our own community. It takes place uh, just up the road in Chattanooga. And we hear so much of it, the murder rate in America is horrible today. Uh, and, and some people will say, well, it's all the gun's fault. Guns are what causes murder. And, and I'll just say that, that guns are a tool, like a hammer. They can be used profitably or they can be used unprofitably. Uh, but guns are not at fault, in my opinion. The fault lies in the fact that people are evil. That's where the problem lies. It lies in the hearts of our culture and of our individuals today. Murder is evil because the murderer robs someone of their very life because of the killer's own selfishness. You know, today, if if the only type of murder that was committed was murder with guns, that would be one thing. But we have murder on a much broader scale. Did you know every day in this great land of ours, every year, thousands of babies are killed before they're born? And our lawmakers have made it legal. And the person who does this killing or who uh, causes it is, is selfish. First of all, we would blame the, the, uh, those who profit from it. Whether it be the 
Planned Parenthood or physicians or even government. They profit from murder. It's selfishness. But second of all, there is a mother somewhere who believes that this is a inconvenient time or this is a bad thing. And they choose to take a life. Now you may be here and perhaps you've done that. You have nothing but mercy for me. And forgiveness is available for you. You don't have to live with that guilt. You'll never forget it, but you don't have to live with that guilt. God offers forgiveness and strength. But the very act of abortion is murder. And on we could go with different types of murder. In fact, we've watched so many murders on TV, we don't even think about it. You think about today's uh, TV viewing, you got uh, CSI, crime scene investigators, and it's always murder. And uh, I don't even watch enough TV to know all the crime shows. But there's a lot of them. And so murder is something that is readily around us so much that we become insensitive to it. And Jesus here says that the murderer has to answer for his crime. And he deserves to be put to death. That's what the law teaches. But Jesus didn't stop with murder. He goes past the action of murder to the heart of this commandment here in the remaining verses. And I want you to notice verse 22, the first verse first portion of verse 22. There's my first thought. Murder begins in the heart because it's a selfishness. Jesus said, you heard that murder brings judgment, but I say to you, I'm up in the ante. I'm up in the stakes. I'm get, trying to get you to get to the intent of the murder. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now anger is a, it, it, it's an unruly evil, like the tongue. It, it refers to a brooding anger a hatred for someone. It involves holding a grudge and wishing someone was not around or they were dead. Now I know it's going to get a little quiet in here today because this is a difficult subject when we start talking about holding grudges. You are almost In fact, you're not murdering their line. You're murdering who they are. Because he says it doesn't stop with the grudge. And he says this type of anger brings judgment. Jesus reveals to us that you don't have to literally kill someone to have murdered them. Murder in the heart is still murder in the kingdom. You see, Matthew is all about kingdom living. That's what the entire book of Matthew is about. It's about living in the kingdom. And this sermon in particular is about living in the kingdom of God and the way God would have you to live. And he said that if you are angry with someone, and you are holding on to that anger, then you are discounting their life. 
you're committing murder in the kingdom. And so, what is murder? What is this type of murder? Murder involves contempt and slander. He finishes verse 22 when he says, Whoever insults or says raka, some of you have a, a King James, New King James, some of the older translations, nothing wrong with them, I'm just going to give you an explanation of them. Uh, whoever uh, says raka or insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Now the word raka there, it's, a, it's an epitaph of slander. It is a malicious abuse. It is an arrogant contempt of someone. It is to hold them in contempt as if you are better. As if you have never done the thing. As if they don't exist. And the word uh, you fool is uh, from the Greek word moros, where we get our English word, who can guess? Moron. It is a malicious insult that takes raka to a deeper level. And Jesus says that, that when you insult someone, you're liable to judgment, and when you call them a fool, you're liable to the judgment, possibly of even hell. The word hell of fire literally is the Gehenna of fire. How many of you remember what Gehenna is in the Gospels? It's that place outside the city of Jerusalem that Jesus talked about. It's where they threw all their waste and it's where they lit a fire and it burned day and night. And Jesus described it, that in that place, there is a gnashing of teeth, there is a grinding that takes place. It's a place where the worm lives and cannot die, but is in constant agony. And Jesus is saying that when you call someone a fool, you're making yourself liable to that place of constant agony. It is a murder of reputation. It is a Murder of their name. Their body may live on. Their personality may live on. But you have killed their name. And Solomon told us that, that a good name is better than precious ointment. And when somebody kills your name, they do so much damage. That's why today that particularly in, in our modern time, when you, um, an accusation is made of, of um, abuse for a child or sexual abuse on the opposite sex, it's an insult, it's an attack on the name that many times can't be defended. That person lives with that from then on. And so it's a great danger to change or to, to affect someone's name and their reputation, to attack their character. And in today's world, slander, is the language of the day. Slander takes place all the time. Our talk shows. Many times are nothing more than one man's opinion about another man. Or one woman's opinion about another woman. And it attacks, it presents information as if it was a fact, when in fact, it is an intolerance of that person. It is an abuse of them. It is a contempt for them. And sometimes even Christians can
and murder another Christian's reputation. I can't stand them. When they come to church, I just want to sit on the other side of the church. I don't even want to look at them. <laughs> We've been so blessed here. <coughs> been so blessed. I'll soon be 11 years. And I don't think we've ever had that. But I've been in churches where they were. And it's awful. Talk shows. Social media. People will put stuff on social media that they would never ever say to someone's face. It is a slander, a contempt for someone's character and reputation. Political partisanship. I'll just be honest, it makes me sick. No matter what side of the aisle you're on, I'm sick of both sides. <laughs> If something major happens in the world, like a bombing or something like that, somebody's going to have to call and tell me because I don't watch the news. It's sickening. I mean, in this day of fake news, you don't know what's real, what's not. I got a lot more peace of mind now since I gave up the news. It's the language of the day. And if we're not careful, as Christians, we'll develop that same language. And not only will we use it against another Christian, but we'll teach our children to use it too. I can't believe they're teaching. I can't believe that coach would have put my little sunshine in the ball game. <laughs> I'm getting close to home now, aren't I? <laughs> James said the tongue is an unruly evil. It's open game for reputation and character with opinions and jealousies. And on with you go. There was a Jewish legend it goes like this, a, a pious rabbi, he leaves the synagogue and as he's walking along, he meets a stranger walking down the road and a stranger who is very ugly greets him with a warm hello. The rabbi looks at him in disgust and says, you raka, you awful man, you're so ugly. Are all the men of your village this ugly? And the man answered, That I do not know. But go and tell my maker who created me how ugly his creature is. You see, when we are ugly to one another, we're not just insulting the other person, we're insulting the God who made that person because in creation, God said, let us make man in our own image and God said, it is good. All people are created in God's image. Doesn't matter what their race is, doesn't matter what their appearance is. In fact, you don't even have to like them. But you don't have to insult them. And you sure don't have to slander them. Some people feel that uh, the need to tear others down because small people make them seem bigger. 
But in tearing down others, what really happens is you get smaller in the process. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. He said, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces what? Good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. When you say evil of someone else, when you murder their character, when you slander who they are, it reveals the wickedness in your own heart. You're not getting better, you're getting murders. Thank God that Jesus came to be a Savior for all men. In fact, he'll make a, he'll make a, a mean man talk sweet. He'll make a hard man soft. He'll make a man who ridicules compassion and mercy. How are we doing so far? I knew. I, 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 I know this is a hard series. But people always said, I like my toes to be stepped on. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> that kind of hurts me. It hurts me preparing messages like this, but I felt God really leading me to this chapter. Let me give you the final point. Don't ignore your neighbor and think your worship will be accepted. Because he goes on in verse 23. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, first, Jesus says, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. The reality is, is our relationship with God is broken when we are angry with someone and we attack and slander. Is God not their own? Or is it you? And, and, and the text really reads, it's not as much as we want it to read. If there you remember, you have all against your neighbor. And that's certainly true. You should go and make it right. But it says, if your brother has something against you usually know. You usually know. And the reason they would have something against you is because you have wronged them. John, the beloved, the beloved disciple, the apostle John, listen to what he said in 1 John 4, 20. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. I'm praying that God will quicken my word, my, my very tongue, every time I think about saying something derogatory about someone else. Because after all, if they knew that you said it, how would they feel? Solomon explained it this way. I love this. In Proverbs chapter 6, this, this is what he said in reference to what, or in relation to what Jesus said. If you are snared, that means to call in the trap by the words of your mouth, call in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, 
save yourself, for you have come into the hand of your neighbor. You've given him the upper hand over you. Go and hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor. Give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. So it implies get it right, right away. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. A fowler is somebody who catches birds who lays a trap for them. He said that when we realize that our mouth has gotten us overloaded and we've made ourselves uh, subject and then we owe somebody an apology, we owe somebody to seek their forgiveness, he said do whatever you can as soon as you can to get free. That's, you know, most of the Baptists don't read it that way. We, we sort of read it like this. Bless God, they did that to me. They can live with it. I can live with it if they can. Fold your hands. Act as if it doesn't matter. And by the way, you may get through this life with it. But don't you know there's a judgment? And Jesus says that your worship will not be acceptable. We're making it plain. We're wasting our time here today if we got problems with somebody and we know somebody's got problems with us. Ooh, that's tough. Second thing, not only will it separate us from God, but judgment will come. Verse 25 says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to the court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. The implication is you're guilty, you know you're guilty, he knows you're guilty, and the judges will know you're guilty. And the judge is going to judge you. And I tell you what, that's exactly how it is. <coughs> Here Jesus is speaking an earthly example of an eternal truth. He says to reconcile with the person you're at great odds with. And Jesus sums it up succinctly in another place where he says, seek forgiveness for wrongs. Why? Because if you're found guilty, it's going to cost you a lot. You're going to prison. Let's look at verse 26. He finishes it. He said, truly I say to you. Remember what I told you last week about when Jesus said, truly I say to you? He says, mark my words. That's what he said. Mark my words. You will never get out until you have paid the last penny 